be free. I feel that I could live any place that I care to in the United States. I call that being free. Welcome to Kramer Manor. Kramer was a realtor from New York. He used to come to Fenwood on a train and walk all the way to Lincoln Avenue and Fenwood over my aunt's house to sell property. I purchased my property from Kramer and he would only sell to blacks. At this time, we are a diverse neighborhood. Thank you. God bless you. My name is Elwood Green. That the Kramer Manor area was the glue for families being forced out of towns like Westfield, Potter's Crossing, of Edison and the rest. This area at the time allowed our parents to provide their children with a first home, stability, security, and equal education. Let's face it, we are a product of the civil rights movement. The exhausted hours of research, we finally talked to an original family member and a good friend, Deacon Mr. Elwood Green Sr. My name is Jill Jackson Jones. I'm from Truth and Racial Healing Initiative, as well as Social Justice Matters, as well as the Union County Club. I'm also a longtime resident of Fanwood here in the Kramer Manor section of Fanwood and Scotch Plains. Here we are today in the Kramer Manor Park where it all started. This was a nucleus for us to develop our bonds between our neighbors as well as our friends and our family, of course. Before I turn things over to Kevin, I want to thank the rest of our project committee, Pam Brownstein, Douglas Lane, as well as Derek Garrett, as well as the support from our community, our neighborhood friends and families that provided their stories, their artifacts, their pictures. I also want to thank Deacon Green, our patriarch from the Kramer Manor section. We would not have been here without him, so thank you. Now I'll turn it over to Kevin Eldridge, longtime friend and Kramer Manor resident. Let's go to him. Hello, all. The reason why this project is important to all of us is we want to show the roots and the foundation of where all of the successful people from Kramer Manor came from. Kramer Manor has produced judges, Supreme Court judges, lawyers, doctors, real estate people, bankers, computer people. Uh, we have a plethora of people and professionals that came from this area whose all core roots started right here at Kramer Manor Park. It is important to show where we came from and why, why we're all so successful at what we're doing in this area. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Pam Brooks. Thanks, Kevin. My name is Pamela Brooks, and I think my experience mirrors the experience of many people in Scotch Plains and Fanwood. In my 35 years as a Scotch Plains resident, my, I drove my children daily to the McGinn School. They played in Kramer Manor Park. We belonged to Congregation Beth Israel at the perimeter of the Kramer Manor neighborhood. My children had friends, teammates, and classmates who lived in Kramer Manor. And yet, with all of these everyday interactions, I knew nothing about the rich history of this neighborhood. We now have really fascinating history about the people who developed Kramer Manor back in, starting in 1924. This is a picture of Harry Kramer of Kramer Realties, and this picture was actually taken in 1921, three years before he bought property in Scotch Plains to start uh, building Kramer Manor. This is his wife, Bertha, with him. His older brother, Hiram, was also part of Kramer Realties. The reason I bring that up is you can see Hiram's granddaughter, Estella Cook, right here in this picture. Hiram's daughter, Goldie Marion Kramer, married John Henry Cook um, in the 40s, and they um, lived for a short while in Kramer Manor. Oh, but you see when we were here, because this was all woods, all these new houses were woods. Dirt all roads. This was, woods. It was, this all was on dirt the scariest roads. streets to go down. When I first came. Yeah. 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 What, Lincoln? Yeah. 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 We used to start here, and we used to get on our bikes or run. 
Ready? Yeah, 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 I used to go hey, Him, Herb, you ready? Uh, ready? On your mark. Get set. We used to run because there was another house. It's, uh, the McCauley's, mm -hmm. Mr. Edwards at the other end, uh -huh. and that was it. Because yeah. this is not the original lineup of how everything oh, no. was supposed to be. It was supposed to be more streets. Yeah, exactly. And all lined the, up in here. All the, originally, all the streets were supposed to meet Cliffwood at the bottom. The but what happened was, yeah, I understand that, but what happened was, once they found out that the blacks were going to move here, that's when they stopped it and they made the woods uh, as a barrier. Kramer Manor Urban Renewal Project. As a youth, I remember Mr. Kramer coming to our home on Jefferson Avenue in Scotch Plains to visit my parents, Clinton and Evelyn Jones. He owned most of the property from West Broad Street in Scotch Plains, New Jersey, all the way over to LaGrand Avenue in Fanwood, New Jersey. Mr. Kramer sold property to several Negro families in the section we now call Kramer Manor. Some of our Kramer Manor neighbors paid taxes in both Scotch Plains and Fanwood because their property was located directly on boundary lines. In the 1920s, 1930s, and 1940s, we had partial dirt roads with ruts that didn't continue and formed into walking paths. No sidewalks and no electricity. So we used kerosene lamps. We also had outhouses because we didn't have inside plumbing. There was no running water so we had to carry water from the spring located off from Evelyn Street and from a well which was on Miss Bertha Lee's property shed pump on Trenton Avenue. Later the town of Scotch Plains installed a spigot on Martine Avenue opposite King Street where we had to tote the water from that location. There were several Kramer Manor property owners including my father Clinton Jones who in the late 1940s was issued a building permit to build a home in the Kramer Manor area on Jefferson Avenue. My husband, Leonard Townsend, was also able to get a building permit in the 1960s to remodel a home on Jefferson Avenue for our family. Sometime during 1961, as our Kramer Manor neighborhood continued to grow, I started reading articles in the Curry newspaper about the Scotch Plains Township Committee's plans for an urban renewal project for our Kramer Manor community. Our Kramer Manor neighborhood was being described as blighted. According to Webster's Dictionary, the definition of blighted is one that withers hope or ambition, impairs growth, or halts prosperity. Sure, it may have been viewed as blighted, but that was based on their opinion of Kramer Manor in the 1930s and early 1940s. But this was in 1961. In our eyes, it was not considered a condemned area as the neighborhood continued to grow. It surprised me and I started talking with several property owners and we got together and had a meeting at my house at 1118 Jefferson Avenue, Scotch Plains, New Jersey. We formed the Kramer Manor Civic Organization, which consisted of Damon Brown, President, Willie Kelly, Vice President, Idel Murray, Secretary, and myself, Anna Townsend, Treasurer. The NAACP President, Plainfield, New Jersey Branch, Reverend A. Allen was also invited to attend. We decided to attend the Township Committee meeting scheduled for June 20, 1961. We were puzzled and we needed to find out exactly what was being described as an urban renewal project. We had some questions. What would it mean for our Kramer Manor and area and the homes that fell on the Fanwood side like Trenton Avenue and Shady Lane. How would it affect the families that were already living there? 
Our Kramer Manor neighborhood and the Shady Rest neighborhood may not have had perfect families, but we were the perfect example of people who were willing to come together and fight for our community. When, when I came here back in 68, Lamont, we were here. We, we were here. Yeah. The first ones I met. As soon as you turn the corner of Trenton Avenue, we were, we were, we were we, off the street. We just seen the group of black kids, a you know, bunch of black kids, because there was about five or six of them out there. We stopped, and the first thing is, hey, how you doing? Oh, you're moving up the corner? Oh, can you race? That's it. We got out the car. Everything was We got out the car. We got out the car, and we raced. Oh, yeah. hey, hey, hey. Now, wait. A, a total transformation for me. Dirt roads, yeah. deer running exactly, around. Exactly, because we move. The guys want to race, and you know, they're so friendly. You know, and I'm like, this is just going to be great. The story of Kramer Manor begins on May 7, 1924, when Kramer Realties was incorporated by the state of New York. Less than one month later, on June 5, 1924, Kramer Realties Incorporated purchased a 51-acre lot for $11,000 from the estate of William A. Woodruff. The lot was comprised of land in the township of Scotch Plains and in the borough of Fanwood. Immediately after the sale, the parcel was surveyed and streets were laid. 606 lots, most of them 25 by 100 feet were laid out. The survey was completed in July, 1924, and the plan was approved on September 4th, 1924. Harry D. Kramer, secretary of Kramer Realties, became a familiar presence in the growing Kramer Manor neighborhood. From the very early days, Kramer Realty actively marketed this neighborhood as a destination for black families looking to build homes in the suburbs. They described it as an ideal colored development. Kramer Manor continued as a black community of homeowners, gradually becoming more diverse in later decades. We do not know the official reception that Kramer's plans received, but we are aware of two fires in 1926 in the Kramer Manor area. Three properties in total were affected. The first fire burned down the store of Matthew Coleman, a black resident of Westfield, New Jersey. And it burned down the barn and equipment and farm animals of George Scudder. The total loss was estimated to be $8,000. The second fire involved the Martine Avenue location of Kramer Realties itself. Evidence of arson was discovered and oil soaked rags and a five gallon can were on the premises, but there was no investigation. Now, Kramer Realty was not selling homes, per se. They sold building lots. In the early years, property owners joined together to build their own homes. One of the early residents was Mrs. Collie Lee. She bought two lots in 1929. Mrs. Lee lived at 48 Trenton Avenue until her death in 1962. Her children also owned houses in Kramer Manor, with her descendants figuring prominently in the community to this day. They can tell the story about how they, hey, how they, they burnt, but they burnt, down. But they burnt the house down twice on my father because yeah. they didn't want us here. Yeah. But by being brick, he built, yeah. he built it up, yeah. he framed it, he sectioned off all the rooms, and they burnt it down. By 1930, three families had built homes on the Kramer Manor lots they had purchased. The 1930 census lists the Lee family, the Hadleys next door, and the Abernathys. 
The street address for all three houses is given as Martine Avenue, Vanwood. The adults were all born in the South. Only the two youngest Hadley children were born in New Jersey. From our team's 2021 interview with William Lee. My mother and father both came from Florida. Now, do you know, do you know what brought your family from Florida up to uh, the area? Well, the, the hope for a better life, right. to get some things that we didn't have. Okay, but how did how did but how did you how did you guys land in in, in, in Scott's place? Well, my mother, my grandmother landed there first, mm -hmm. and I really don't know how she came to come there. And at that time, we had the house when we were born. We had the house on we called it Wilson Avenue. Mr. Elwood Green recounts interactions with Harry Kramer and sheds light on how lots were bought, sold, and paid for. See, Kramer lived in the, well, his office was in New York. Mm -hmm. Every Saturday and Sunday, Kramer would walk from the train station to my aunt's house on Lincoln Avenue. Okay. And him and Papa John would have the wine and he would lay out his big map. <laughs> and uh, people would come in and purchase property. At that time, the lots was $250. And I knew a lot of people, especially from Westfield, that purchased property, but they lost the taxes. Uh. And when, like, I purchased my property from Kramer himself, Every Sunday, when I would come out of the church, Crane was right in the front of the church. They said, Elbert, Elbert. <laughs> so sometimes I give him 25 cents. Sometimes I give him 50 cents. Sometimes I give him a dollar. So to make a long story short, it came a long time I didn't pay him for like maybe three or four years. I didn't pay nothing. So uh, my brother said to me that I lost my property. So I called Kramer's office. They said my balance, I think it was $150. Uh, so I sent the check over and they said, I need this property here. It was a struggle for many purchasers to pay off the $250 or $299 they owed on each lot. And most buyers bought at least two lots. Once they owned the land, they were faced with the formidable challenge of building homes without bank loans, as the federal government refused to back mortgage loans to black applicants. Neighbors helped each other weekends and summers to construct homes without bank financing. Harry Kramer took his own action on behalf of the residents. Historian David Freund details Kramer's efforts in his book, Colored Property, and I will read from that book now. They asked me if I had FHA approval. I told them no. The reason was that it is a colored development. He then said, I am sorry, I cannot do anything for you. On the QT, he said, word had been passed around that no loans will be given to colored developments. Kramer recounted this story in a letter to Franklin D. Roosevelt that summer and appealed for help. He said, Knowing the feelings of Mrs. Roosevelt and yourself in this matter, I wish to state that I represent people who are loyal and patriotic citizens, but any member of them are bitter in their hearts to think that this great and glorious country should discriminate against them on account of color. Mr. President, he concluded, is there anything you can do to assist us in getting a loan? Fully eight years after Kramer's plea, and five years after he declared personal bankruptcy, the Truman administration at long last made it possible for Kramer Realties to market lots in Kramer Manor with the assertion that loans were approved by the FHA for building. As a result of persistent families insisting improvement initiatives are complete in the neighborhood, 
the first fire hydrant was installed on a corner of Trenton and Roosevelt Avenue. More lots began to be sold to non-black individuals and other entities. Neither Highland Swim Club opening in 1953, nor Willow Grove Swim Club adjacent to Kramer Manor opening in 1959, admitted black members for several decades. However, some people growing up in Kramer Manor in the 1970s remember swimming after hours. With either the unspoken approval or those in charge turning a blind eye. And I let these kids swim, because I can't swim. You know? <laughs> but I let these kids swim as long as they didn't go in that deep water. You know? And they were swimming, it would be dark out. I said, just keep your voice down, don't be loud. <laughs> because uh, uh, people in the neighborhood can hear you. You know, and the people over the neighborhood can hear you. They don't be doing They tell them, you know. So, uh, you know, these kids they had a lot of swimming in. And they did swim down there. And there was, there was a couple of guys who my brother knew from the high school, and coaches, Ray Smithson. Mm -hmm. He was one of them. He was, he was the principal. Yeah. When I was in school. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He was, yeah. He was, he was one of the guys that turned his back the other way as long as I was there with the kids. And he was in Shula. They turned their back. You know, they, 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 they let the brothers swim. You know? I mean, they, they don't be swimming in that water with the white folks. <laughs> <laughs> you know? One of the most important developments during the 1950s was the erection of formal structures for several churches that were founded many years earlier. The first of these churches was Emanuel Baptist Church. Emanuel Baptist began in the late 1920s in the home of Sister Hattie Brown. The first pastor was Reverend Smith Cyrus. Throughout the 1930s and the 1940s, regular services were held in the homes of various members including the garage of Sister Collie Lee, until the church bought several lots from Kramer Realties in the 1940s. The church initially contracted for lots on Jefferson Avenue, but later took title to a parcel at 1130 Lincoln Avenue, which was fanwood at the time. The cornerstone was laid in 1950, and the building was completed in September 1952 under the leadership of Reverend Thomas T. Weaver. The second church founded in Kramer Manor was the Warren Temple Church of the Living God, located on Evelyn Street. Like Emmanuel, Warren had humble origins. Reverend Warren was actively involved in the community, advocating for Kramer Manor. Well, well you know, if you look back, you'll see that there, were, uh, there was a, a church behind my grandparents' home mm -hmm. at 48 Trenton Avenue. It was called a COGIC, Church of God in Christ. And they used to have a little banner sitting up on the, the, um, on the, the trees. Was it in the garage? It served as a garage. Yeah. It served as a meeting place. And uh, it, it served as a church. You know? So that's before the churches were there. That was the first church over there. Well, that, now, I don't know if that was the first church or whether that there was another church, the Warren Temple, that was on Evelyn Street. Right, that came after. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, that came after. Yeah, yeah, that came the after. Room. There was a barn, a big barn, a big red barn. And that's where Reverend Warren held church, this big red barn. And we used to make fun of it because <laughs> we said when when it, when it, it they get to shouting and the... Uh, and the wind started blowing, that bond, that bond's going to come down. <laughs> Both churches were built with strong community support that reached across denominational lines. Many of the same people who helped to build Emmanuel Baptist also worked to build Warren Temple. One of those community builders was Sylvester Buster Hadley. Hadley built the home he and his family lived in on Trenton Avenue. Bobby Lee recalls, Hadley, it was a guy, Buster Hadley, and his wife, and he had three sons, uh, James, uh, Sylvester, 
and, he, and a daughter Mary, and he had another another one. I can't, I can't can't think of his name right now. But he always said that he was a Moorish American. Oh, he was a Moor. Yeah, and it was he was see Buster Hadley L. <laughs> E L, you know, he would put that in his name, and he would he would be riding in his truck. That's what he had. But Hadley, uh, uh, his son was a little older than my brother and I. But he he would tell us, well, my father was going to the temple in Newark today, and that temple was supposed to be somewhere on Prince Street in Newark. Mm-hmm. And if, if you recall in Newark, that was a, yeah. a thriving area. Yeah, that's like, yeah, that's like a Broad Street. Yeah. Right. And, and they would, they would, that's where they would have their services. Now, whether they had the services once a week or twice a week, I, I don't know. But they used to wear these red fezzes, these hats. The story of the third religious institution, Temple Israel, now Congregation Beth Israel, began in the late 1950s. After the death of Harry Kramer on June 22, 1956, the township of Scotch Plains sold parcels in Kramer Manor to satisfy tax arrears. In 1959, the Scotch Plains Township Committee sold a parcel with 135 feet of frontage on Martin Avenue to sell gold on behalf of Temple Israel. The congregation set about raising funds to build a synagogue on the site subsequently purchasing a second parcel while also holding religious services in various locations in Scotch Plains. And on January 17, 1964, Temple Israel held its first service in its new building. The 1960s were pivotal years for Kramer Manor. Successful community organizing, school construction, plans for a park, and overdue neighborhood improvements mark the decade. Residents were especially spurred to action in 1961. That's when Scotch Plains officials designated Kramer Manor as blighted for urban renewal purposes. Initially, no Kramer Manor residents were named to the Scotch Plains Redevelopment Agency or its Citizens Advisory Committee. Soon, concerned residents created the Kramer Manor Civic Association. Also in 1961, the Reverend Frank W. Allen, president of the Plainfield NAACP chapter, and others insisted on involvement by Kramer Manor residents on urban development issues. The Redevelopment Agency then asked that its Citizens Advisory Committee be expanded to include Kramer Manor residents. That same year, residents in Kramer Manor and Shady Rest, Scotch Plains' largest black neighborhood and now known as Jerseyland, formed the Scotch Plains Civic and Protective Organization, which monitored master plan and urban renewal proposals. For almost 40 years, Kramer Manor residents had developed their own roads, dug surface drainage, and built their homes. They now were seeking improvements and development of underdeveloped land as well as home repairs. Ultimately, federal urban renewal was doomed by the township's lack of homes to relocate displaced homeowners, a federal requirement. And in 1964, the Township Committee favored rehabilitation over urban renewal. Kramer Manor residents had other victories as well. They opposed an original location for a new elementary school, and by November 1966, the William J. McGinn Elementary School opened at a different site. They made their voices known elsewhere. In the mid to late 1960s, Sewer installations and road paving projects were completed in Fanwood and Scotch Plains. Homeowners in both municipalities questioned the accompanying assessments, citing long neglect of the areas.
what happened was when we used to come every year to be a circus down here. This is oh. before the tennis courts were here. Oh yeah. And yeah. he knows more about it as far as they were well known circus. Potsy because, brothers. Potsy brothers. Because why I know Potsy so much? Brothers. Because one year when they were down here, the ringmaster, his daughter, was no no trapeze. It was artist. a trapeze artist. <laughs> was Columbia. Found, was, was was found with um with Johnny. With Johnny. <laughs> and Johnny took Johnny into the uh, big tent and left me outside. Most of the early homes erected in Kramer Manor were built in whole or in part by the property owners. Homes built in the early to mid-1960s continued to be marketed primarily to African Americans. Many of these new residents worked in law enforcement in high-ranking positions such as police directors, lieutenant detectives, and FBI officials, to name a few. Interestingly, Robert Lee, the first black police officer in Scotch Plains, hailed from Kramer Manor as did the first two black officers in the Fanwood Police Department, Kyle McKinley Jackson and Timothy Green Jr. Hello, I'm Kyle Jackson. Our family came to Fanwood from Newark in 1973. Our father was working for the Newark Police Department. Our mother was working for the Essex County Sheriff's Department. Word about Kramer Manor section of Fanwood had spread to Newark. There were approximately three other families with ties to the Newark Police Department prior to our family's arrival. There was also two or three other families with ties to other law enforcement agencies, including a federal agency. In 1992, I had the opportunity to attend the John H. Stamler Police Academy, which is located on the same property as the Scotch Plains Votech. The new police academy program was called the Alternate Route. Approximately 20 of us were sponsored by the Union County Prosecutor's Office. When we graduated, we were like free agents and could apply to any police department in New Jersey. This saved municipalities from paying for a recruit for approximately six months while they were in the police academy. When I graduated from the police academy, there was an opening in the Fanwood Police Department. I was hired as the first black patrolman in Fanwood history. At the same time, my good friend Daryl Peoples became the first black chief of the Fanwood Volunteer Fire Department. I sing because coming again. We're having a wonderful time this year as usual. And I think the crowd is even bigger. 
Hi George, I'm Corbin Green, like I said, we're here as usual and we're always working together. Hi George, I'm Vicki Cook and it's good to be here every year. Hi George and all of Fanwood. We're sorry you couldn't be here with us, but George, you're here as usual. And as usual, we're having a great time. Everybody has worked hard to make this event happen and those coming and enjoying themselves. Hello, George. I want to thank you again for coming to share and help us with this black corner. <laughs> Hi, George. This is Linda. And we're thankful that the rain held off. <laughs> Amen. Yes. Amen. Hi, George. I'm Heather. I'm here to the community. So I want to say hi. Thanks for throwing a lovely black corner. Oh, I thank the party. I wish everybody a night for July is safe and happiness. And I want them the best healthiness. Love you all. And happy. You want to venture? Let's go down Lincoln. This is, this is how scary Lincoln. this is. This is good. We should make it a little scary. So I'm going to tell you another thing we were scared of. What's that? Uh, Mr. Lincoln. Nixon. Hey, how you doing, my friend? My friend, my friend. How you friend. doing, my friend? <laughs> Daphne was our second baseman on one of our championship teams. Yeah. <laughs> the hardball team. No, we Daphne, we damn, Daphne. Was, damn, Daphne. Daphne was, Daphne was, Daphne was it. Daphne played everything. By, by, being, uh, by being a switch hitter? Yeah. 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 They trying to throw the ball away. Uh, and, and he switched to the left hand. He hit. switched to the left and hit it out. Yeah. The, thing, the one thing that got me, the, creative. the most creative thing that ever got me, and he got in trouble for this. Is Jinx and Gerald Mara. Jinx went and took his mother's curtain rods, <laughs> the white ones, and put them. Remember, he came, he went and came, put them down on his feet, and went down the hill. And when he tried to put them back, they had the water in between his mother's curtain rods. <laughs> when Lincoln was watered, he got a beating. I'm with, I mean, things like that. I mean, you don't. Come on. What's the biggest thing you took away from from growing up in this park, all y'all? Uh, I would I would have to say a sense of community. I know that's low hanging fruit, but I mean. You know, okay. as a community yeah, you know, and strengthen, you know, I, I, having relationships. I, I got, I got to say, team building, relationship building, and, and just knowing how to interact with people. It taught the park taught us how to interact with each other on a whole bunch of different levels. Uh, almost like what they were saying. Um, see the difference of what we now call freedom out here. You know, we felt free out here to be able. I couldn't get beaten anymore at 10, 11. I was at your house too, 11, you know, it didn't matter. I couldn't get beat anymore. So I had the freedom, good or bad, you know, um, I had that freedom to be able to explore and express myself in ways if I was in a different community. Like you said, it could have been some different and results. Funny, I, yeah. I would just say like life and friendship. Yeah. With this guy, I've known this guy since I was six years old. And I remember them moving in and we just looking across the street at him. And I was like, oh, that's yeah, something different. Come. Yeah. No, but it was, I mean, that's, this is. Just like, like you guys said, like the family, and it's like, family is not always blood because. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's I it. Feel that, you like just said it right there. You guys are my family. That's right. We all share the same bloodline, but we're definitely family. So what does Kramer Manor look like today? Well, today, our neighborhood is of about 100 homes and is a family rainbow of many beautiful shades and of several cultures. Our blocks are filled with a mix of long-standing residents, multi-generational Kramer Manor families, and newer arrivals who are getting acquainted with the neighbors, towns, schools, and now the rich history of the neighborhood and, of course, Kramer Manor Park. We hope our neighbors continue the Kramer Manor tradition of nurturing strong relationships and lasting bonds, just like we did. As we look to the second century of Kramer Manor's existence in 2024, let's not forget the vision of the two entrepreneurial brothers and the energy and stubborn determination of the great-grandchildren of enslaved Africans who built this foundation and the homes that many of us reside in today. Let's continue the legacy of this historical neighborhood, educate and preserve. Tell everyone it's a fascinating story. <laughs>